can hopefully screen share with no issue. So, Oh, very cool. Okay, so I wanted to actually present um, my entire screen um, so you didn't see the bit of PowerPoint that I'm using. Um, however, I forgot to print my notes, so I also have my notes on my computer screen, which <laughs> I need. <laughs> That's all right. Hey. So, um, I apologize for that. So um, what we are kind of delving into tonight is the OEM. And oh, you well, might okay. hear some, uh, uh, I found a, quite a lot of people say Ogham, um, even, you know, strong British accents. I found a lot of uh, people who pronounce it as Ogham, but in Irish, it is actually pronounced Oam. Um, so the Oam we're going to get into is a tree alphabet. It's a divination tool, and it's also a way of connecting to the land. So we know that uh, Celtic peoples use this language in connection, but I'm gonna kind of talk about how we can take pieces of that or maybe even most of that framework, but then also add it to our own personal environment, our own land and our own landscape. Uh, because the whole premise of this, and I'm gonna kind of get into a bit of history around Druids and, uh, and about um, more specifics about Ogham before we actually make our set, because I think it's helpful to kind of put this into a setting so that we have a sense of how this kind of came about. Um, so I just love this quote as I was looking around on all things tree. Uh, the clearest way into the universe is through a forest wilderness. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I was trying to get myself into this mindset because um, I am by no means a, an expert on this subject. I started researching this in the last couple weeks because it's something that I felt like I was interested in and I have like almost no experience with plant energy or with druidism. I've done some reading. I have a great book about druids. Um, if you what is a druid? <laughs> so the druids were... Unless you're already going to cover that. I didn't, I just want to make sure I'm not lost. Nope, not at all. So the Druids are seen today in modern practice as they were like the magicians, the seers, the oracles, um, uh, the spiritual advisors of Celtic peoples. And I think oh. in that that was true, that that was one of their roles. But they were also like the intelligence class. They were like the learned ones. So uh as a druid, there were subsets where you would be a bard, where you memorized all of their oral histories. You memorized all of the Brehan laws, which we will get into. Um, mm -hmm. So they were the advisors of kings. They were the people in every clan who everyone would go to for all kinds of advice. For you would go to a druid if you uh, had a dispute, and they would be the judge of that dispute among people. So they were significantly more than kind of this modern idea of these guys in white robes that hung out in the forest and kind of communed with spirits. There was absolutely a spirituality and a connection to the stars and a connection to the land that they were a part of, but they were also integral in Celtic society as judges, as um, the... Uh, advisors of kings and such. So they had a really huge role um, across all of the Celtic people. So I will get into a lot of things that happened in Ireland and also in uh, Scotland, but the Celts actually stretched across Britain and France and down into Spain and what was formerly known as Gaul. So originally they stretched across a massive portion of Europe and then as Rome grew and overtook those places, they became more and more Roman. But Ireland and Scotland stand apart because they were never conquered by the Romans. So a lot of this material exists that we know that the Irish were doing because they didn't get crushed out as early by the Roman Empire and by Christianity. So 
I'll go into that um, a little bit more as we go forward. But one thing that I was thinking about is, I mean, and you both know that my, the way I get messages um, are basically almost always animal energy. It's almost an, always in the form of animal guides um, and sometimes uh, human guides, but the vast majority um, are animals. But I've also absolutely just especially at the start of kind of like exploring all of this spirituality, like I've walked through the woods and for some reason I'm like, I want to hug that tree, you know, mm -hmm. like an actual mm -hmm. urge to hug this tree or to speak to a plant that I'm walking by, you know, that I, I moved to in a moment to just like ask how your day is going. And it was always like lighthearted and kind of funny and in, in, in a passive way, but I, I wanted to start exploring that more. And I think, Kala, maybe even as we go through, you might have some insights of, uh, some insights of connecting to uh, that land energy, those spiritual energies, because I think you have some more uh, practice in that area. So all of this started just because I started thinking about those things and that I wanted to start um, making some of those connections. Um, and also, um, as I'm thinking about uh, this tree alphabet, this connection to land, trees rooted, grounding, my own nature is very much water and fire. I am mm -hmm. not a grounded being by nature. Um, that's something that I have to actively work to do and pull myself back from. I can spiral out into emotional realms. I can spiral into passionate creative realms. And so I want something to kind of balance those parts of myself and kind of ground back down. So that's kind of where, why I started thinking about this <laughs> is finding that balance. Um, and this seems like a potentially a really great way for me to do this. But also, um, as I was thinking about it, I thought maybe somebody else will be interested in uh, hearing more about what I'm researching in sharing this. So um, as we scroll here, so here is an image of the Oum alphabet. So it became known as a tree alphabet significantly later in history, though the Celtic calendar does have um, tie-ins to these trees and most of these root words are trees. So it's not uh, a stretch that it became known as the tree alphabet. And I'll talk a little bit about how um, some of those um, some of those names or those associations were added later because we're kind of piecemealing some of this. We have some information, but like a lot of modern pagan practices, we're pulling from a diverse and maybe even limited information to craft something that feels like what we did before or, or what was happening before, but is definitely has that modern twist of how we're using it. So, um, <sighs> Oum was first seen carved on stones in the fourth century, and those stone carvings continue into the 10th. So they uh, began in Ireland, they spread across Ireland into Pictlin, which is now Scotland, England, and Wales. But uh, there's a lot of information that the Oum existed, was used for far longer before the fourth century, um, and it is very likely used by the Druids as uh, their own language, their own way of communicating, and that they would have written on um, wood or perishable mm -hmm. objects. Um, and so they didn't stand the test of time and we no longer have them. And as time progressed, it became a more common language, a more generally Irish language, as opposed to that like intellectual class of the Druids or a secret language, um, and would be used, as you can see on kind of these stone, um, these Oum stones, they could be place markers for like so-and-so owns this land, or it might be a really quick story that like this really amazing hero did this cool thing in the spot. Um, and it will be something that everyone could read. So it seems like it started out as kind of a secret language, but as the Roman start and Latin started to trickle in, um, there are a few ideas of maybe why that emerged into the common folk. Um, which I will continue to talk about here in a second. But the idea was that early Celtic people passed on their stories orally. So Druids and Bards were these keepers of this historical and spiritual knowledge um, of all of the people. And so this idea that 
especially with all these plant and tree associations, um, that they were not putting it on stone um, is, I think, is not a stretch. There's, as I said, there are some gaps and there are differing uh, views about that, but there is a lot to support that this has been around for a really long time. Um, let us see here. So there are a few theories on uh, why the Ulm emerged in the fourth century. Um, and it was one is that they were just, the Irish were trying to create some cultural uniqueness. They knew about Latin, it was around, and they wanted to have their own thing that they could read that Latin speakers could not read. Um, so as a way of kind of keeping some of that culture. Um, or hiding their their words or their stories from Latin speakers. Um, and others believe that it was a way to kind of intertwine Irish and Latin. So we were they were speaking Gaelic, Latin was coming in and it was a, a written way to as a combination or a merging of those those ideas, which there is some um, backup for that because the OM only has five vowel sounds and in Gaelic there are 10 vowel sounds. So there's there is at least in what we see in these stone carvings that are emerging in the fourth century, there is a Latin influence. But as I said, that it could easily have shifted because there's a lot of um, info that this was around before. And um, this is a quote from Caesar, which I just love. There are a lot of Romans who wrote about the Celts and you have to take a lot of what they say with a grain of salt because they looked at the Celts as ignorant barbarians that needed society, that needed Roman culture to like pull them up out of the dirt, um, which is, um, I mean, just not true. And we'll talk about that, their system of law and, uh, and everything that they had going. It was very different from Roman, but also very sophisticated. Uh, so Caesar said, uh, the Druids do not go to war nor pay tribute together with the rest. They have an exemption from military service and a dispensation in all matters. Induced by such great advantages, many embrace this uh, profession of their own accord and many are sent by their parents and relations. They are said to learn by heart a great number of verses. Accordingly, some remain in the course of training 20 years nor do they regard it lawful to commit these to writing. That practice, they, it seems to me, to have been adopted for two reasons, because they neither desire their doctrines to be divulged among the masses of people, nor those to learn, to devote themselves to the less of the efforts of memory, relying on writing, since it generally occurs to most men that in their dependence on writing, they relax in their diligence of learning thoroughly and employment of their memory. Um, and I, I love this quote because um, one, Caesar is known as a pretty reputable source because he actively met and spoke with and was uh, worked with or was around Celtic peoples, where a lot of other Roman writers were writing second and third hand information that really got, you know, boogie woogie. Um, and, but Caesar is, is a pretty reputable source. And we know today that, um, that memory is decreasing because of writing. We know that our brains are not the same. Our, it's so much more taxing to memorize things than it once was because we no longer need to memorize. And we have all of these written sources. We have, you know, all of our books and we have ways to store our notes. And so I just thought that was an interesting thing that the oral tradition lasted for so long because it was a way of keeping it insular and it was also a way to prove that you were worthy that you could memorize every single story every single law like family trees it would have been you know a task of epic proportions and clearly something mm -hmm. that you dedicate your life to um and i just thought that was neat <laughs> agreed <laughs> me too so uh, what is the OM? The OM is many, many things. So um, each symbol, symbol similar to the uh, Norse runes is a letter. Um, it is also attached to a plant or, um, or a natural element. Um, it has its symbolic meaning, its larger um, definition, which is what we would use in divination. 
Um, it is part of the lunar calendar. So the first 13 letters of the Oum are the uh, trees that are associated with the 13 months of the lunar calendar. Um, and it's and each is also associated with a color and a number. So the color came from natural plant dyes. So every single tree, you would either harvest leaves or bark or root depending, and every tree would have had a written and a, and a known color um, and then numbered throughout. So the symbol could represent, it gets, I can imagine it would be very confusing. It could represent a number when you were listing something, it could also represent the letter. It could also mean the word, the specific word of what you're talking about. And it can also be used to have that greater meaning when you look at it. Um, along with that, it's also been associated with the notes of the harp. And there's one reference, which I can't remember where it came from, but I found this in a few places, that not only um, was it this name of a plant or associated with this plant that every tree had a sound and not just the sounds mm. or notes on the harp, but they actively could hear and listen and know the sounds the trees make when the wind blew through them and know the different sound of each. So they were so connected with that environment that you would hear the sound of the ash tree in spring and know the sound of the ash tree. And you would also know the sound of the ash tree in winter when it had no leaves, which was a different sound, but that there were these notes connected to it. So wow. what's, that's cool. <laughs> what starts to kind of come out of this is a very, very clear attachment to the land where they lived. And the importance of this land and the importance of the trees um, will come forward even more when I go over those uh, Brehan laws, um, that it was clear that there, there were strict guidelines about how you treated the land and really, really harsh punishments if you harmed a tree. And they had a whole system of um, the kinds of offenses or the, the kind of punishment depending on the tree. Um, so, um, it is, it's multifaceted and I, as we talk about, um, we make kind of, as what I was calling this practice OM to begin, I think this practice speaks to something that's so much bigger and more connected that if you really get into it and you want to create an OM set, that it's something that will be a process, um, which I will also get into. So sacred trees. Um, all that we know from the Druids, as I said, a lot of this is coming from second and third hand sources, and we have to really be careful about trusting what the Romans say about them, but there's also um, some, some wonderful info out there. But I do love um, this little piece of skepticism. This was an actual thing. I can't remember uh, who this Roman was, but he basically damned the Celts as <laughs> evil and barbaric because they cut their carrots into circles instead of <laughs> sticks, right? So instead of quartering and having them in long chunks, they cut them into circles. And he quote, who said, they look like <laughs> eyes floating on the surface of their stew. And like, this was like damning. How could they possibly cut their carrots in a different way? And that's ludicrous, but it was actually a piece of information that they use of like, we can't trust these people. Clearly we need to cut them. They need us. That's funny. When I make soup, I cut them in tiny little squares. In squares? Yes. Oh. Like see, even if it's a little baby carrot, I slice it long and then like that. And they're little tiny, like in the canned soups that you see, yeah. they're little squares. Yeah. Yes. Mm. I think it's because I don't <laughs> love carrots. So I put them in there for color and of course they go in soup. It's part right. of that. <laughs> nice and small. So it's like almost like you don't have to chew it. They just, they're just there. You're getting mm -hmm. it. But Yes. There's a French word for whatever it is. With, it's onion, celery, carrot uh, that starts a soup. I always forget the word, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a word. The trifecta, and I don't remember what it's called either. Yes, it's French or something. My sister-in-law always says the word, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, so one really interesting thing. There were a lot of people that um, 
suppose that the word druid came actually from a Greek root word because druse in Greek is oak. Um, but there are also uh, a lot of Celtic etymologists who believe druid derives from um, the Celtic root words, clearly, because we believe this existed far longer than the Greeks' influence on uh, trading with the Celts, um, would be druid, so D-R-U-W-I-D, which meant oak knowledge, or the druachtwid, which was, would be an immersion into knowledge. Uh, so it comes back to this idea, one, that connection to the trees, oak is uh, really prominent in Celtic stories um, and uh, was um, abundant in the land, uh, but also this idea that it's about a lifetime of knowledge collecting. Um, so I just, that root of either being oak knowledge or an immersion into knowledge, both seem pretty fitting for what we know about them. Um, there were also said to, uh, there are now four provinces of Ireland, but originally there were five. And there's uh, stories that every province had a great tree, a massive ancient tree at the center of that province. And again, this was a place where uh, kings would be christened underneath the boughs of a tree. It would not be formalized unless a tree was present. There are stories mm -hmm. that continue of ash trees and hazel trees and oak trees that have uh, that are named and prominent as though they are figures or heroes or people because they were so important. And also even still, so many, so many names today still in Ireland are related to trees. So Kildare, its root was, um, there was a church built in Kildare when Christianity was moving in, but it means church of the oak. And so there um, mm -hmm. is speculation that they put the church next to the oak tree because they wanted the pagans to move into the church. And they're like, look, your tree's right next door. We're the church of the oak and we're kind of doing what you're doing, but it's a little bit different which is what Christianity did all over the world. It would enmesh itself in whatever that culture was and then kind of take over over time. Um, Duro means plain of the oak. Dairy is not the oak grove. And so all of that still exists. All of these early names of, of places were named for trees. This place that is around this important tree. Mm. Um, and I just find that so fascinating there because there are, Again, culturally, there are different cultures who, yes, they would connect to the land, but they connected to so many cultures connected to the animals, the physical beings. And yes, there are stories about those, but it seems like the Celts more than any other that I've looked at were, had a spiritual connection and were speaking to and communing with plant energy in a way that other cultures just were not. Um, <clears throat> And so sacred trees. So my little bullet here um, at the edge of water between the mountain top and the sky between the wood and bark. So there is a text that describes these are three places that the druids go to gain knowledge. All right. So clearly these phrases and these are quoted uh, are places that you could connect to something higher than yourself. And I immediately had this sense that each of these things, each of these places would be visited for a different purpose because think about how, um, how each is different and how each would uh, connect you to that worship. So when we think about at the edge of water before the Celts transitioned into a patriarchal society around the time that Christianity was moving in. They worshiped the goddess Danu, and Danu was the goddess of the water. She, and from the water, everything was birthed. So to gain knowledge at the edge of water, to me, implies seeking the goddess. So if you go to the edge of any, at the ocean or a river that you are connecting with that goddess energy, where between mountaintop and sky, raising yourself high, finding that high peak and only having like your, the sky between yourself is 
you have that sense of connecting something that is outside of and higher, right? Raising yourself up and making that connection. And where between the wood and bark, and it's interesting because between the wood and bark, you would think like, oh, I like got this, this image of like carving bark away and like looking at what is inside. And actually that was a crime that was punishable. So the, the sense of this is that you would, you would connect spiritually. You would go travel under the bark into that essence, that spiritual place um, that is inside the tree to make that connection. And the oak in particular um, is connected to the God. And the God, because of the waters of Danu, grew, was able to grow up strong and large. And so that connection between the bark is like that masculine energy that, you know, rooted, that growth, the stability, the strength of the oak tree or other trees where that water is the flowing emotional intuition um, goddess self. And that feels like a lot of that. Um, I didn't read that anywhere. I saw those three phrases and that was just like what made sense to me when we're looking. So if we were connecting to the Oum, not only are you connecting to the individual spirits of the trees and the plants, communing with them as a being that can speak back to you, you could go to places in nature and kind of bring those specific questions to different areas. Um, this is just a little poem from um, Longfellow, but it also just spoke to me. It says, this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks, bearded with moss and in garments green, indistinct in the twilight. Stand like druids of eld with voices sad and prophetic. Stand like harpers hoar with beards that rest on their bosoms, loudly from its rocky chasms, the deep voiced neighboring ocean speaks and in, in accents disconsolate answers the wail of the forest. And so this is modern, this is late or modern-ish, late 1800s, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. But that was during a time of resurgence of connecting with the land of naturalists and like looking both scientifically and spiritually at at being outside. And uh, it really seemed to kind of fit with this. Um, so along with those three places, groves also became known as places that Druids would go to have ceremonies, to um, have discussions, to call judgments on disputes, um, to pr have rituals. Um, it, among the groves is also that sacred place because all of the trees were sacred. The land itself was sacred. So you might go to those spaces with particular questions, but even in the day-to-day, -day, you would be under a tree or you would go to a grove to make any kind of decision. And this is the coolest thing. I just love this. So as I said, certain trees were used to raise men to kings. Um, certain trees would have attached a hero story. So it would, even though it was about the tree and the tree spirit, somebody who did something close by, that story would then be attached to that space and that tree. And so when you looked at that tree, you would know, or you would have heard also the story of these other people in the area. So they're, they're really entrenching themselves into those plant energies and also allowing them to speak out. And trees, and this is another direct quote, are known as the silent witness. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I, I just absolutely love that. So they were, they stood in non-judgment and were the keeper of all knowledge. So in this, the trees and groves of Ireland and the British Isles were the people's connection to all. And you could also make a connection that trees, that silent witness, that holder of all is the Akashic record. Mm. It is the portal. The trees are the keepers of this knowledge. They are also portals to access all, not just, you mm. know, that information, but that it was, it was their place, almost like that umbilicus to travel into and connect to 
um, that the Akashic record. And I, I've found a lot of parallels between like Indo-European um, early, um, <clears throat> what became Indian, right? And then early Celtic, they had a lot of similarities in how they set up their kind of their caste system and also those, uh, those beliefs to things outside of themselves. Um, this um, is another great quote by Caesar, and I think it kind of brings this around. So they wish to articulate uh, this as one of their leading tenets, that souls do not become extinct, but pass after death from one body to another. And they think that men by this tenant are in a great degree excited to valor, the fear of death being disregarded. They likewise discuss and impart to the youth many things respecting the stars and their motion, respecting the extent of the world and our earth, respecting the nature of things, respecting the power and the majesty of immortal gods. And so this is a really interesting thing because there seems to be a little bit of like a, an understanding or a respect from Caesar in this, in uh, learning these things, because again, they were seen as these barbarians that offered nothing. And then as they began to meet the Druids, these, uh, the intelligent class, you know, the, the mages and judges, they were like, oh, at least he could admit that like, they're onto something. They do have this belief system that is strongly entrenched and, uh, and these connections of, of respecting those things around them. Um, so as I said, the turmoil of just the clans in general, Roman culture, Christianity, and then also the advancement of agriculture, um, which was the clearing of countless forests, um, all played a part in kind of the slow end or common use of the oum, and also that following a, or earth-based faith. Um, so the rest of Celtic lands, like I said, what is Spain and France and England, those became uh, Roman uh, significantly earlier, um, where in Ireland and Scotland, they were still using the Oum and still practicing um, this faith until the early fifth century. So they clung on to it probably 150 years, even more than other areas. Um, but this is also worth noting. When we think of Ireland, we think of these rolling hills, these open places, these stone walls. But um, early on, 80% of that island was covered in dense, dense forest. And because of agriculture and because of that transition away, by the beginning of the 20th century, they had less than 1% of trees on the entire island. And it's only wow. been more recently that people were like, whoa, what are we doing? And started replanting. And I'm pretty sure, I don't know if I made a note of it, but I'm pretty sure they're up to about 15 or 20% now um, and continuously working to kind of bring back that indigenous plant life. And I think also because of that resurgence of this land connection of people wanting to be connected to the land and also be connected to these kind of older faiths that feel maybe simpler and more rewarding than the Catholicism that they've been entrenched in for a long time. I think that is part of it. So um, now we will Ooh. make them eventually. <laughs> have like lots of history, but I, I hope that it's uh, worth hearing. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Brehan Law, so in the pre-Christian society, uh, Brahans were judges and they laid down the law. There was also that intermingling where Druids would also be those judges. Um, and this early body of law is now recognized as um, most likely uh, or is the oldest known European example of a sophisticated legal system. Um, and this survived almost completely intact right through the early Christian period until the arrival of Normans. And then again, that shift happened and a lot of that trickled out, but even some of those laws still existed into the 17th century. So originally they were composed in poetic verse, they were memorized, they were spread to everybody, um, and, it, and they were actually uh, known as laws of the neighborhood. 
And um, <laughs> because they were completely pastoral people, uh, fines did not come down um, in money. Everything was about barter. So any law that was broken would be about bartering your goods or repaying or restitution. Um, so it wasn't about units of money. It might be like you owe, um, actually, I'm pretty sure it was two and a half cows. If you harmed an oak tree, you had to forfeit <laughs> two and a half cows. Um, and then half cows. Yeah. <laughs> the trees, uh, would be part of that. So, um, in Brehan Law, they classify trees into four classes. And in that document that I sent you, those are the four classes that make sense to me to use. When I was doing a lot of, when I was doing this research, I found like five different OEMs and they had them labeled as in different classes. Every single one of them had trees in these different in different categories. So in one, it, they were like labeled chieftains, but in another, it was a peasant, and in another, they were uh, really sporadic. Which seems kind of weird to me when you have access to Brehan Law and you know exactly how they classified their trees um, in those early days. So this is how I would use it. So you have. Um, the nobles of the wood, you have the commoners of the wood, the lower divisions of the wood, and the bushes of the wood. And, and in that doc that I sent, those are differentiated out. So when we go to cast or we're doing a reading, that might play a role in how you read, like level of importance. It's almost mm -hmm. like if we looked at, if we had our nobles of the wood, those might be like our major arcana in tarot right? And some of these lessers might still be powerful and important, uh, but maybe more like your, your uh, lower level cards. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that, again, <laughs> is going to come with how you interpret that. But um, each of these is uh, separated out. And yes. That's fascinating. Um, so we have this list. So the nobles are oak, hazel, holly, yew, ash, pine, and apple. Mm -hmm. And um, in stories, oak, hazel, and ash are probably the three most prominent, constantly referenced. Like three of the five great trees were ash trees. Um, hazel trees have this connection to uh, dropping the nine seeds of knowledge, the nine hazelnuts of knowledge that the salmon consumed, which made it this hyper intelligent being that could see the future. Um, and then again, the oak is that God connection, um, is also the God connection in Norse mythology. Oak is connected to Odin. Um, and in Germanic cultures, oak tends to be that kind of like primary chief God. Um, so those three really stand at the top of written stories of references, um, but also the rest are labeled out in their law system. So they clearly played an important role, whether it was like, this is lumber that we need to use for building certain materials. And they were very particular about the, how they harvested those materials, how they used them and how much was allowed to be used. Um, so part of it is like, is the necessity of being a, like growing out of a hunter gatherer culture and needing to, uh, protect what you have. And then part of it is that magical spiritual connection, the spirit energy of those items. Um, so um, one thing that I just wanted to note, now every ohm is connected to a plant, except for the the five additional Pictish ohms that came out significantly later. Um, they still have some attachments of like strange things like elbow, upper back, <laughs> <goal>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even some of the early OM, everyone was, I, I wasn't able to find like earliest examples, but I read a lot that not every single one was attached to a tree. That is something that, that kind of transferred over time because the first 15 were trees. They like followed suit and added in or replaced words that were strange things like upper back and connected it to um, a plant. So we don't really know, but I, I think again, you 
uh, you ask the question, you look at that and you get the sense of what that answer is and you, you're not going to get a wrong answer from spirit, right? So you're going to know those definitions and what makes sense for what you're working with. Um, <clears throat> And also, so when we're talking about this modern interpretation, and we've been talking about how interconnected the OM was in Celtic culture, in the land, in the environment, in all people, you know, at some point they could read it, they would recognize the trees, they would recognize the plant dies, they would understand their importance, they would know the laws for and what would happen if they harm trees, they would know that if you had a dispute, a druid was going to take you to a tree, and you were going to figure this out. So it is very much entrenched on their island in their land. So something that we should think about for ourselves living in America in the Northeast, we have a lot of things that are very much the same, but you might create your own OM. If you started doing this work and you started reaching out and kind of building your own vocabulary or your own communion with these energies, then you might have something, you might get a different answer than the definition that is on the page that I sent you, which is an amalgam of a lot of people's ideas about what that is, right? So if you really took the Druid's path, you really connected to the land in your own backyard, spoke to a tree, you know, that is on your property and you know, on your sheet, it says that it's a gorse tree, but here, like you're talking to an aspen and you have this clear sense that this is what the aspen means and this is the message, then that is what it is, that you automatically go with that because we're going, we're going to these places. We're moving between the wood and bark to find our own answers and to listen to what is there. So um, I trust the definitions of a tarot and I use tarot and I love Oracle cards and I build off of that. But this feels a little bit different in that, yes, you could use those Oracle cards and you could get correct answers. But if you were really exploring the OM, then it's about having, it's about a conversation with an energy and not just kind of like, I'm asking a question and spirit is answering it through these symbols. It, it feels like more of a dialogue so that adding trees and adding plants to your OM, creating your own symbol that doesn't feel irreverent or wrong or that feels like the right thing to do. It feels like if you really are building this relationship, then it's really likely that you bump into a plant that isn't listed here that you could potentially make this connection with and feel really powerfully drawn to. And then you could add that, you know, we're going to make our, you know, our own sticks. You could add your own to that because you know it and you've spoken to it and you've learned about it. Um, and I think that's another thing that I really love about this is that it's not, it's not set. It's not in a box. It's like very much about going out and create and finding the thing and finding what is part of you and kind of adding to this language, taking that framework and building something that is deeply personal to you and to your own land. Um, and I feel pretty excited to kind of start doing that on my own. <laughs> um, okay, so now we can start making our, uh, our OM. So our starter set, I have just possible six, right? I sent you the list of our definitions and we also have our um, images above that we can put each of these letters on. So just as a reminder. Um, How many do you need to start with? So there are, there are two schools of thought. The original uh, alphabet was 20. Um, the picks continue to use OM long after the Irish stopped because the Irish became Catholic. The Northern, the Picts who became the Scots continue to use that. They added five more significantly later. Um, I don't think that, and they used this language longer than, um, or maybe not longer because they got it from the Irish and the Irish had been using it, but they continue to use it when nobody else in Britain, Wales, or Ireland was anymore. So they added those five. So 
I plan on making a set of 25 and incorporating those five extra. Um, but a lot of the sets that you will see are just that first 20. Um, so that's going to be up to you what makes sense and, and how you want to use that. Because uh, I didn't have time to get anything to make, mm -hmm. so I was going to kind of draw them out mm -hmm. for now, because I didn't have a chance to get a, a supply, and I don't have anything here, no sticks, or... Yep. I had nothing. <laughs> well, no worries at all. So, this simple one, I'm going to uh, would draw them out, and I'm going to do kind of show you how you could cast them. It is similar to um, runes. Um, but, so the ohm is red from the bottom up. So if we were making our OM stave, I would have my line and they would do this little V shape at the start and end of a sentence. So on our OM, I would have my line, this V is at the bottom. And then when I drew in whatever my OM shape is, you could have it like this. So Okay, so this mm -hmm. tent at the bottom, we would read from bottom up, and we're just- Oh, wait, Lisa, I can't see. I can only see, well, I can see your face, and then I have- um... Click on your screen so you can see the, yep. the third window that has yep. the other camera in it. I see that. Then, oh, wait, I don't see it. Hold on, hold on. Where am if I? you hit the um, little plus bar, the plus bar, yeah. It's like a little blue. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, yep. On the corners. I see it. Okay. okay. Yep. So. Oh, okay. So we have a little tent at the bottom. You have your straight. So tent. one on each end, right? Yep. And we would read oh, okay. from the bottom to the top. So if I wrote out a whole sentence, I actually show you. I want to get it as a tattoo. <laughs> um, I don't know if we can see, I made it in two shapes, but this phrase, it starts at the bottom and moves up. You would read it upward like this, or mm -hmm. if you're on paper, you read it right to left. I have mine oh. backwards because I want to have it tattooed on. I want to be able to read it in a mirror. So I have it drawn out this way. So it will be the, it would be the reverse on my body, but I just made a note of the bottom of where you would read it from. So if you were actually writing out ohm, which you could use it in a, as a talisman or um, use it in another way, you're just putting out your lines and you're working bottom up. Okay, so I'm going to scroll back to, and I'm actually going to, um, share my screen so this is a little larger for you guys here we go aha okay so um you can see that our b is just one single line to the right side l or is the double line to the right side and we can draw these out so f and v are the same uh shape u and w are the same shape and I, J, Y are all the same, right? So we can look and see in here um, how these are drawn out depending on the letter. So these, um, the A, E, the E, A, the O, I, the U, I, those are all, remember how I said OMS uh, clearly had that Latin influence when we were seeing it written in the fourth century because it only had five vowel sounds. The picks added in their other vowel sounds into the OM. So now there are 10 vowels instead of just the five that are in Latin because the language they were speaking had 10. So that's where those extras come from um, when they were utilizing them. So on each of your um, staves, and that is what they are called, the, the branches, um, the um, wood that you would put your oam on are your staves, and each one is going to have just that single oam. Also, as you're getting used to it, feel free to write out what it is. So uh, you could even write the letter B, you could write out birch. Um, I don't think um, 
I in included in the document that I sent you the Irish word and the English word. I like to see the Irish word, but we don't speak Irish, we speak English. And so if you wanted to make a note on the bottom of your stave until you get comfortable with them, particularly for this kind of, this first set as you're getting used to it, write birch right on there. So on B, write out, I have my, um, my stave, and I'm probably going to pop birch right on the bottom as a note to myself. And do you put it right in the middle like that, or is it no preference? I don't think it matters. However you would want to set it up, um, do so. So on each of these, I'm just making that note of what my letter is. I'm putting it in the center, and um, I will end up with my 25 here at the end. So uh, talking about casting, there are a few ways that you can do this. Um, one, you could draw them out just like we draw out runes. You could have them in a pouch, you would feel around, you would pull one, that would be your single answer. You could pull three and you could have your... <clears throat> Bless you. Thank Bless you. you. You could have your past, present, future. You could also cast them, just like we talked about where runes, we have the white cloth, and you would cast your, um, your runes down on it. I saw it set up as the fabric itself has a past, present, future. So when you, so say I, I'm gonna draw, I draw whatever, nine, and, or whatever number feels correct. And I have my space here, and I just had them, and I cast them out. Clearly, I didn't really throw them, and they're really jumbled up. But let's just imagine that we're doing it. <laughs> right? Um, you could have a piece of paper that is, or a pretty large piece of fabric that is broken into thirds that is past, present, future, and see where they fall. Or you can read them as we would read runes when we cast that nine, is that you would start from the center and you can move outward. So the items that are closest to the center are closest to the heart of the issue. The items that are moving away are maybe extraneous or like say we have some that are really cast aside from the edge. Maybe they're important, but they're not gonna be important for a long time. Okay, so you can make those arguments of do, uh, do they run parallel to each other? Do, are they crossing over each other? Um, so like if I had a bunch that were crisscrossed, I would say these items are very closely linked. They're tied together and they're gonna be part of that message um, where maybe, and again, you're gonna develop this language as you used it, but maybe things that are running parallel to are multiple options. Maybe not one stands out above the rest and you're gonna say like, okay, these are a lot of things that could happen and what can I focus on that is the end that I, that I want to see, right? Um, so drawing, drawing them out by hand or casting them out um, is a way. I also saw um, a sheet that was like, it was an X and there were the four diamond shaped quadrants um, and, but I didn't have time because I was still like getting some of this together today. Um, that might be associated with like, uh, the points of the compass, northeast, southwest, and maybe there are some attachments there. So I think you could really make the call. You might not even need that past, present, future. As I said, you could just draw them out or you could just throw them out, see how they fall. And that is how you would you would cast for that uh, divination meaning, right? And you would, again, we would look at our definitions. I don't know if I added them here. Um, I might look at my definitions and say, how are these things linked? Um, what is the message for me here? What are those um, things that really stand out to kind of um, make that connection? Now, I'm, I'll go back so we can keep writing out. You can create that first set. Now here is what I thought was very cool about a longer term set. And this is what I mean in that deeper connection that you would go and you would find a piece of every one of these trees or plants that you would actively collect it yourself. You would go out, you would seek it out. You would ask permission 
you would take that piece, you would have a conversation, a communion, you would leave an offering, you know, you, and that you would start to build the energy inside that stave, inside your own oem as you build this up. So I think you can have your set that you use like runes that you cast out and you can make that connection. But I think what really makes sense is if this is something that you're like, wow, I love this. That's when you kind of begin this much deeper journey of on this day, I'm going to go out. I'm going to kind of listen. I'm going to see what I find today. I'm going to be like, mm, this birch tree, this is the one. This is where I'm going. I'm going to find that perfect piece. Maybe it's something that's fallen. Maybe it's something that you ask permission to cut away. You have that conversation. And now that is added into your repertoire. Um, you could also, um, in some of those examples, there are beautiful sets on Etsy that are not very expensive, that someone has also gone out, has gotten those different pieces. They've already collected them and created them. They are from each of those trees. I don't think that's less than. I think that you could utilize that and it could be very powerful. But I also think even if you got that other set, you would want to take your oak out to an oak and have that moment of conversation and ceremony or ritual so that you're getting your message and that energy from that place, that tree that you felt like this is the one that I want to sit under, that you're making those connections. And because I think all that does is add that power and strengthen the connection that you're making um, as you work. So um, on their own, as you say, like spirit's not going to give you a wrong answer. You're not going to be lied to or led astray. But I also think that the more comfortable you get and the deeper that connection grows, that maybe the more in-depth those messages are or the, the easier it is to receive that message, that, you, that it becomes a knowing because you're so connected with it that you don't even have to cast them. You, you're, you're creating a personal connection and you're speaking to birch tree like I would call on hawk right? Mm -hmm. That I, on a certain day, I might say like, I'm re I'm reaching out to you and like, give me this message. And on another day, it might be like, Oak, I like, I need to be grounded. I need that stability. I need to be able to endure something that is challenging for me and like, and make that um, connection and draw in that energy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's something that's just gonna, if you do, I like, it feels like that's something that, you know, it could even be years of time, you know, that you just, you just listen. And then when you have the thing that feels right, you add it and there's not any pressure of that. It's not done yet. Uh, because in the end, all, everything is about that deep connection of like finding what is around you and in connecting to those spaces. And it feels really powerful to have that dual connection for me of like this animal energy, this lower world energy versus uh, plant energy, which I, as I said, I haven't connected to. I don't really understand what that feels like or what that looks like or how it could be different. But I know that sense of grounding is something that could be really valuable. And then maybe there's a third aspect that is that higher realm, you know, that is another tool of connecting to ascended masters, connecting to higher dimensions in those other realms. And I think you just, um, I like the idea of having multiple options in my toolkit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Ah, so I love this. One I, I think I just get a little confused because I, the letters are really the trees. Mm -hmm. And then, so I started drawing the, these out. So you, it, it's like birch. And then what is Lewis? So let me pull. Is that a tree? Yep. Yeah. So oh. I'm going to. And then it goes to fern. 
Yep. So that is and Willow. It's like it's not a normal ABC. My brain is very uh, human is to not. ABC. It is not. Uh, Which I know it isn't. So uh, here I on the that, that I sent you, I also... yeah, that's what I keep looking at on my phone. Yeah. I have that. Yep. On the yeah, email. me too. He is Birch, and this blue is actually Rowan. Okay, so I would write them out. So oh, would... so it's the second word that's the. Yep, is the English word. So on here, um, birch is my first, and then on my second one, I, I'm writing it right out. Yeah, I wrote it too. Minor, right? And then fern. Mm -hmm. And so, and then also, I talked a little bit about these multiple um, definitions um that have some of them so in some of them if i found something for it i included it and others i don't know more about like what that could be uh, but for example when we look at rowan so classically right now it's seen as protection expression connection and we have that symbolism but actually this uh lou that that root was either the root word of flame or blaze or plant or herb. So the root words are to shine or to grow. And they're not sure which one it was. It could be to shine or to grow. But that also to me feels like that just adds to this idea. If I reach out and I'm like, okay, Rowan now is really about connection. But maybe for me, the blaze is what really stands out that flame, something that is shining and bright and lighting a path. Maybe that's what it ends up meaning to me when I make that connection. So wherever I could, I included other versions. But again, I think it will come down to that, that conversation. Um, that general symbolism and then also spiritual uses, kind of like in um, the farmers, is it farmers? The, um, the um, animal guides book where it's like, these are symbols about it. And these are like, call on me if. And I try yeah. to kind of yeah. break those out into into those two ways. So all of these definitions are amalgams of, from probably eight different sources. I looked at what yeah. people said, I found commonalities, I added things that really felt like they made sense to me and use this. So uh, you are not bound to use, you know, my listed definitions, but I just thought they could be a good starting point. I'm sure they are, yes. <laughs> so as we um, kind of move through, um, yeah, so F and fern, and fern looks like the plant fern, but also that's the Irish word for alder. Oh, so the second word in okay. usually is the one that yeah, we would. The second word in is, that Engli is the English word of what, what we're using for. Um, so I got birch right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, Ireland. Awesome. I want to move to Ireland. Yeah, it's amazing. I, yep. And I, I, I can get dual citizenship because my mother was born there, I believe. Really? Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. And then I will come visit you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just, the hospitality and the energy of the... I do want to visit. Of the falcon is just something else. It's just so wonderful. But it's, is it, it's big, though, so how do you know which part to... Oh, you, you want to go everywhere. You want to go everywhere. Yeah. Um, when Jeff and I went, we went to the, we stayed northern, which was really cool. It was, a, it's just gorgeous up there. And I remember when we landed and, and we were renting the car and the guy said, oh, so where are you going? And we go, we're going to the north. And he goes, why are you going there? I'm like, because it's beautiful. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. Okay. Yes, because I don't know. Are they, are they all at peace now? Or I don't know. I don't even know the history as I should. But No. Not really, uh, no. Belfast no. is still contentious. They still have fully armed, like, military uh, oh. and with assault rifles mm -hmm. on street corners in certain neighborhoods. They haven't had a bomb go off in a while. Actually, when I went a couple years ago, one week later, they had their first car bombing that they had had in like a decent amount of time, six or eight years. Um, so it's still a little contentious, but the land mm. is gorgeous. Oh, it's beautiful. It's just so amazing. It's just so amazing. And I, it, it feels, to me, it feels a way. Um, and also just the people, I, I know I've like chatted about like stories, but it's just the the energy of 
people like w being in this tiny town and we go to this tiny restaurant and it's a Saturday morning and we're having breakfast and like everyone in the town is shoved into also eating breakfast there and they were shouting at each other across <laughs> the table across the restaurant and be like Michael Michael we'll have to see you later and he's like I'll be coming over after supper I just have to finish these things up and they like just shouted at each other mm -hmm. and like told these stories and you were just there and then and it was just this wonderful you know we went back to that place because that's where everyone was going that night and <laughs> um walking late and i swear to god three old men in tweeds just sitting at the mm -hmm. bar nursing their pints traditional music going it's like oh like in a movie and mm -hmm. i and we like walk in and the, they all turn and look, and one of them just goes, hey, you're late. <laughs> but at least we showed up. And they were like, ah! pull up a chair, move a place, get you a drink, join in. You know, it just is that oh. wonderful. And that's in the north? <laughs> that was, for me, that was in, mm, where were we? We were in, in the southeast, probably. Um, in, um, but landscape wise, um, Northern Ireland, they're a beautiful place. The whole island yeah. is beautiful. But in Northern yeah. Ireland, there are just some vistas, man, that can really, yeah. really take your breath. Yeah. Great. Thanks for Definitely the tips. Definitely worth a I'll visit. Look, look into going. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, well, um, I hope this was cool and fun and helpful. It was. Uh, I do have a question though, Lisa. Yeah. So when you draw your main line, mm -hmm. you have, you have um, the upside down V on the bottom and the V on the top. Is that how you do yours? So, and then, and then whatever line it is after, you know, for the letter itself. I actually just realized um, in doing so. So I started putting my words at the bottom here, which would okay. give me a sense of what the bottom is. Yeah. Okay. Um, right? Oh, yep. But yep. I'm remembering now why in a sentence you would see both, but on the staves, a lot of people only put the V on the bottom. So you know the bottom. Which direction it falls, right? Because if I turn this Oh, up, yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be yep. a different letter. Oh. So because okay. I doubled up on both sides, I'm going to yep. put my word at the bottom. And that's going to be okay. a symbol for myself so I know the direction that it is. And also it gives me that word cue. But as you're getting used to what these look like, so that if it was like this, I wouldn't maybe accidentally confuse it for another letter. Yes, for like, another yeah. letter. I understand. Okay. 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 Oh, so cool. So I went out today and I got, well, I'll just hold up my whole stick thing here. I got all of these. It oh, took me an hour. Ahead. Yeah, well, it took me an hour and a half. Um, but what I did is I went to the spot where I um, do my journeys from. So, you know, where my lower world and my upper world is. And so I just kind of walked around there. I did get, um, I did get oak. I do have a crab apple tree. So I got a piece of a crab oh. apple tree. Um, but a lot of them... A lot of them have like, um, because the, it, obviously I didn't plan well enough because it, it was all wet. So the, the bark was all falling off, but underneath it, of course you see like all like the little like insect lines and everything. And I have one, like, I don't know if you can see this here. Oh, it's beautiful. Right? But, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's what I'm going to, you know, I love the idea of going out and getting a piece of like every one, but I know on my land, I don't have all right. of those trees. Right. Um, and so for me, that would drive me crazy, right? I'd be like, oh my God, I gotta get this done. Um, <laughs> so for me, just knowing that they came from a sacred spot, um, you know, where I journey from to go here and there, um, I think for right now is gonna be, is gonna be, magical i yeah. mean i just i love i absolutely love this um and i i can't wait to i figured you would too because you uh you go into the woods for that work and i don't mm -hmm. know is it do you have a little 
of natural setup, like, or not furniture and shit, obviously, but like, do you have an area that it's, it's just seated comfortably, but natural? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I take a chair out with me, um, or, or even I'll just take out, you know, uh, a, a a rug or something um, and I'll sit there. I don't do it in the summertime because of the bugs. So my favorite time is, you know, fall, winter and spring. Yeah. Um, summertime is, it's just too buggy, but um, yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm, my vision one day is to have a little she shed out there, yeah. you know, and, and be able to like, you know, do whatever I do out there. But I haven't, haven't got to that point yet, but eventually maybe. Um, sure. I just yeah thought. yeah so absolutely and that's kind of how why I wanted us to have almost like this I'm calling it a starter set not to like mm-hmm. demean it in any way but so you can start to do the work and then as you go like you can say like oh okay I'm out on this hike here yeah. is this tree that I know isn't in my land maybe this is a nice opportunity to alternate or move those into what you're using yeah absolutely yeah right absolutely you can add or take out or yeah I agree I absolutely agree with that and I and I love how um you know things are going to change right so you don't always it's not always going to be exactly you know what what it says on the paper right so if if you find that that feels different for you I love how you said you know be free to like change that because that is so true, right? Like it might not feel like, like when we look at our animal book, right? Sometimes it just doesn't feel like that. You know, it's different, mm-hmm. you know, because you've asked the spirit of that animal to tell you what it is. So um, I love how you incorporated that, you know, that it's okay to change yep. that. Yeah. And I think the important thing is, is like, I think for a while I had this worry of like, that you're, you're somehow being sacrilegious because you're not, you're not honoring this whole idea of, of this spiritual thing, right? So like I might journey and I have these facets of things that I have been told are pieces of this shamanic path, which I haven't experienced, but like that I haven't like learned about, but that I had this experience with and that I can trust that Mm -hmm. what I get and that that isn't by not knowing it all or not completely following this one idea isn't a negative and it's not a slight to that faith and it's not taking away from those beliefs. It's just that I have the belief that you can get that information Mm -hmm. in a thousand different ways. Absolutely. And, And however it comes that you get to a point of comfort, like yes, in the beginning of your learning and you're not sure if you're trusting yourself and everything but you get to a point where you know what you are getting and right right, so if I read that no I like I I want to like double check and look like that definition is absolutely not what I felt Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that isn't me making it be what I want it is me actually hearing and connecting and knowing that Mm -hmm. what I got is true Absolutely. And I I think that's the difference that you have to say that it's not, you're not um, mocking or making something less than Mm -hmm. it is that you get to a point of connection where you know what you know. Yeah. And you have to, and you have to trust that you have to trust that you have to trust your guides and, and not you know, keep going back to the book, right? Oh, well, I saw, I saw a hawk today. Well, what does that mean? Well, you know what? connect with that hawk and he will tell you what it means right and that's you know that's that's where the magic is yes you can use it as a reference but it's connecting with that spirit it's connecting with that tree and and seeing what you get and and that that is right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely that's part of that ego thing going in saying yes it's abc not cba Mm -hmm. exactly well However it comes, it comes. Right? Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. Awesome. Yep. Ah! Well, ladies, this Thank was you. another fun. Looking forward to the next thing you can cook <laughs> up. I know. I know. I'm having so much fun with this. It's, uh, yeah. I have my uh, cabinet of curiosities with my students, which I'm doing all of these things. They're also learning about the OM. They made oh, rooms. Oh, cool. 
They, we, and uh, the school loves you, I bet. To, I bet yeah. they love you. They've been uh, allowing me to, but I have to always, like, incorporate, like, the cultural connection. So I'm not, like, saying, like, this is, like, a faith kind of thing. But I can be like, this is what the Celts believed, and this is how they mm. did it. Like, this is something that the Native Americans uh, did, and this is what they believed. So if I put it in a cultural context, I'm allowed. <laughs> very, yeah, very cool. I, I love that. <laughs> love that. But, yeah. yeah. So, what, do so you want to say kind of hello? Double dipping yeah. in that. So, I'll whatever I come up with next, I'll keep you posted. Sweet. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. This is um, this is fascinating. I can't wait to get started on mine and and see how it all bring them out to the woods and see what we what we get. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Me too. Me too. And if and, and Colette or, and me, if we if I think of an interesting subject in this in this stuff. I'll I'll present it, not present it like you, but have you present it? Absolutely. <laughs> like say, what yeah. about this? Let's figure out this. Let's learn about this. If I if I think of something, you yeah. seem to know all these different things, and I do not. I think we should have we should have a, um, you know, once, you know, whoever's interested gets their first set together. Maybe you know we could plan something where we meet up again and we, you know, whatever if it's virtual or if it's, you know, here or or wherever. That would be really cool to do. Yeah, I would love to be outside. Um, yeah, I would love to get together. And also, as I build this, I would also. Uh, really appreciate your expertise in these things um, because I it, it's just funny that you could feel self-conscious but I feel so comfortable with how I get messages that this feels like something that might feel a little different and so just like insight and kind of like setting up that groundwork to start making those connections um, I would yeah. love that yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we could always plan to just, you know, do something here out in the woods or wherever. I, I think that would be great. Yay. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. Yep. Yes, mine's on paper at the moment. Yay. Oh, yay. <laughs> well, I had to scribble. Well, so I have to re restart. You know, Louise, if, if, you need, if you need to, you know, come out and find some sticks, you're more than welcome to, you know, come here. Well, thank you. And I have a few yeah. Not much in my yard, but some stuff. But I just did not have time to prepare. I've been busy yeah, with that I silly corporate world. I'm yeah. going to email you the image that I used for the OM alphabet. There are quite a few that have slight variations and then don't incorporate the double or triple letter overlaps. So I will send that picture to you so that you can oh, good. making your set. Yeah, because I was starting, oh, look, it was starting to look a little confusing on some of the letters. Yeah. Yep. I will send those. Yeah. Up. Yay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. It was so good to see you ladies. This was awesome. Thank yeah. you again thank, for yeah. your wonderful thank you, Lisa. knowledge. Absolutely. Good to yeah. see your thank faces. You. Yes. Yeah. See you guys. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Bye. 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 Bye.